Our sermon text this morning is taken from Acts, Acts 26, verses 4 to 23. These are the words of the living God. This is Paul speaking. He says, My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you, that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them, even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with them, with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance." For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Let's pray together. Almighty God, everlasting Father, you did not abandon your son in the grave, but you raised him up just as you promised that you would, so that all who trust in him might become your sons and raised to newness of life now and raised from the dead at the last day. So Father, please pour out that same Holy Spirit now upon all who hear these particular words. And may they truly know Christ and the power of his resurrection, because we ask for it in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. Far too many people in the church are not truly converted to God. Far too many people in the Christian church are not truly converted to God. They are religious, maybe very religious. They are conservative, maybe very conservative but they do not know Christ and the power of his resurrection. They know about Christ, perhaps. They, they could answer Bible trivia questions. Uh, they, they know catechism answers. They know, they know a lot. They have a lot of head knowledge. But they do not know Christ, and this is obvious because sin still has power over them. It is obvious that they don't know Christ and the power of his resurrection because sin still has power power over them. They're still dead in their sins, even while they may think they're serving God. This is really, think, think about this. There are millions of Christians in this land, millions of professing Christians in this land, and on this Sunday, of all Sundays, there are perhaps more than ever will be meeting in churches today. This, this, you know, if, if you ever go to church, you go to church on Christmas and Easter, right? And, so, th and this, so this is one of those Sundays where we're going to have um, sort of the highest numbers in church saying he has risen indeed, hearing scriptures read that, that, that we've just heard, 
that he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. And then many of them will walk out of those churches like nothing happened. Many of, many of them are going to walk out of those churches and it will have changed nothing about their life. Uh, they, 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 it will not change, uh, you know, their, their marriage. It's not going to change how they're dealing um, with sin in their life. It's not going to change how they're dealing with their kids. It's not going to change how they're, how they're actually living in public, in their businesses, or in the public square. How is it that we have so many millions of professing Christians who have so little impact? It's because they don't know Christ. They profess Christ. They don't know him. They know about him. They don't know him. There's uh, Jesus in Matthew 7 has some really terrifying words. In Matthew 7, Jesus says there are going to be some, there are going to be many even, who say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Didn't we, did we not do mighty works in your name? And he will say, he says, and I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know who you are. These are people who know God's name, Lord, Lord, who even were able to cast out demons in his name, work miracles in his name, do mighty wonders in his name. But if you keep reading, this is where in Matthew 7, it goes immediately into the parable of the, uh, the foolish man and the wise men who build their houses on the sand and on the rock. Remember, in the parable, both men heard the word. The man who builds his house on the sand and the man who builds his house on the rock both heard the word. That means they both went to church. <laughs> they both went to church. They both heard the word. The difference was the wise man obeyed. He, he heard the word and obeyed. The foolish man doesn't obey. The foolish man hears the word and doesn't obey, but says, Lord, Lord, and maybe has a pretty interesting resume. He, he goes to church. He says, Lord, Lord, he knows about God and maybe is even able to work some extraordinary things, pull some pretty significant things off and has a pretty interesting, striking resume. And to whom Jesus says on that last day, he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. I never knew you. This is our issue. This is our issue in this land. How can we have so many people going to Christian churches? How can we have so many millions of people who say, this is, this is my life, this is who I am, and it have so little impact on our land? It's because far too many people in the Christian church are not truly converted to God. This is what Saul, Paul, thought. He thought he knew God. He thought he knew God. He thought he was serving God until he met the risen Jesus, and the risen Jesus gave him a new life. So this is the third time Paul has actually given this testimony in the book of Acts. By the way, you can kind of think of this message as a transition back into the book of Acts. Uh, we recall, if you've been around, I've we've preached through Acts, and we got up through 14. We need to pick up back up at Acts 15, which we're going to do next Sunday. Um, so we're not at Acts 15, but, you know, just warming you up to Acts again. But this is Paul's third time giving his testimony, which means it's a pretty significant part of the story of Acts. It's, his, it, he, it's, his, it's, his third, it's the third time it's recorded in the book of Acts. Here, Paul is testifying before King Agrippa. So he was arrested in Jerusalem, accused of letting Gentiles into the temple, which was against the Jewish law, and has now been arrested for some time and has been sort of passed around various rulers, and now he comes before King Agrippa. So Notice this, and we're going to come back to this at the end of the message, but this is a political context. So in the, mid, in the midst of a, um, a, a personal trial for Paul, um, it's a political context. He's in the public square. It, it, imagine this being uh, sort of like in a courtroom or a palace or a capitol building. That, that's where this is happening. He's giving testimony um, in the public square before King Agrippa. And here, Paul gives his testimony and says that he grew up as a strict pharisaical Jew. And of course, you hear Pharisee and you want to boo. You think, oh, that's bad. Well, no, you, you stop. You got to remember that the reason why you think it's bad is because of the New Testament. Okay, because the New Testament trashed the name. So after, after the New Testament, Pharisee became bad. But in the days of the New Testament, in the days of the first century, Pharisee meant Bible-believing conservative. So when you hear him say, I was a Pharisee, you need to be thinking him saying, he's giving his credentials and he's saying, I went to the most conservative seminaries 
that there were. He went to the most conservative seminaries that there were. Remember that the Jewish um, Jews were broadly, their leadership was broadly broken up between two parties, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You've heard those names before. But you need to remember that the Pharisees were the conservative ones. The Pharisees were the ones that accepted the whole Old Testament canon. So the whole Old Testament they held to, they said that was the word of God. The Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Bible. Okay? So the Sadducees only had a little bit of the Bible and rejected the rest. The, the Pharisees were the conservatives. They said, no, the whole Old Testament is, is the word of God. The Pharisees were the ones that believed in miracles, believed in angels, and, crucially, believed in the resurrection of the dead. So that was, that was key to um, the Pharisees. They were the conservatives. The Sadducees were the ones that didn't believe in all those things. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels, didn't believe in the resurrection, and they said it, they were like the first century liberals. They said, well, that's, you know, maybe in your heart, maybe in a spiritual sense, but not in a historic sense, not really, not um, truly. So when Paul says, I was a Pharisee, he's talking about how conservative he was, how seriously he took the Old Testament, how seriously he took his Judaism. Now he says, that's what he, that's what he grew up as, and now he says he's standing before King Agrippa for the hope of the promise that God made to the Jews. That's verses 4 to 7. And that hope and promise to the Jews was the resurrection of the dead. And that's what he says in verse 8. He says, how, is, is it really that strange? King Agrippa, uh, to believe in the resurrection of the dead? So he, that's the point. That's the point. He says, that's the particular thing that's got me in trouble. Paul says he thought that he was serving God before. He thought he was serving God as a Jew, and he thought he was doing that particularly when he began persecuting those who were following Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I thought I was serving God. I thought I was serving God when this new sect came along, these Christians, these people who followed Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, and so I was right there at the front of the line condemning them. I was voting for their execution. We see that in the story of, of Stephen, of course. He said, I was pursuing them to put them in prison, and I was pursuing them in great anger, great vehemence. That's verses 9 through 11. And then he says, it was in that hot pursuit of Christians even to Damascus, so this is how intense he was. He was even going to this far northern city that was far away. He says, I was after Christians uh, going to Damascus uh, to, to persecute them. That a bright light shone out of heaven, knocking him and his companions to the ground. And the risen Jesus confronted him. He says the, the, the resurrected Jesus, the risen Jesus, confronted him, confronted him in his persecution, and then commanded Paul, commissioned him, to become a minister and a witness of him. That's verses 12 to 16. Now, in particular, the particular commission that Paul was given was to preach to the Gentiles that they might have their eyes opened, turning from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and that they might have their sins forgiven and become holy through faith in Jesus. That's in verses 17 and 18. So this is the particular, particular summary of his mission, the commission that Jesus, risen, risen from the dead, met him on that road and said, this is your job. We're going to preach to the Gentiles so that their eyes might be opened, so they might be turned from darkness to light, they might have their sins forgiven, and so they might actually become holy by faith in Christ. Paul explained to King Agrippa that he was obedient to that vision of Christ and that he had been arrested by the Jews for no other reason than the hope that the Jews have that the Messiah would suffer and then be the first to rise from the dead before bringing light to all men. That's verses 19 to, 22, to 19 through 23. Now the Bible describes two basic patterns of conversion to Christ. The Bible describes two basic patterns of conversion to Christ. One is the stark conversions of complete pagans. Okay, so one obvious one is the stark conversion of complete pagans. And the other is a quieter, subtler conversion of covenant members. So the Bible describes both kinds of conversions. Uh, an example of the first would be Paul, Saul, on the road to Damascus. Right, there you have him, uh, a complete antagonistic to the faith, complete, hates Jesus, hates the followers of Jesus, complete darkness, and then kablooey. Right? It's, it's a radical change. Darkness to light. Darkness to light. 
death to life. It's a, it's a radical change. It's a radical shift. That's the example of the first, which we find in Scripture. An example of the second kind of conversion, the more subtler of covenant members, would be like Timothy. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul is writing this to Timothy, but alludes to the fact that Timothy grew up learning the scriptures from his mother and his grandmother and appears to have known the Lord from childhood. So that'll be an example of a covenant conversion. Samuel would be another example of a young covenant conversion. Remember Samuel in 1 Samuel 3? He's a young boy. He's ministering with Eli in the tabernacle. And there um, it says that he didn't know the Lord yet, but then the Lord comes and calls him in a, in a, in a pretty um, immediate and direct way, an unusual way, and then he comes to know the Lord as a young boy. That's 1 Samuel 3. So you've got these two kinds of conversions that we see in Scripture. One is the radical conversion of pagans, and one is the covenant conversion um, often of children at, at a young age. In the first scenario, it need not be overly dramatic like Paul's road to Damascus um, um, conversion, uh, but the transition does tend to be radical, darkness then light. So it doesn't have to be quite as dramatic as getting knocked off your donkey and being blind for three days, but it's, there's still a pretty radical shift. You were going one way, and now you're going in a completely different direction. That, that's what we mean by this more radical or stark conversion. Um, C.S. Lewis, in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, tells the story of his conversion, um, which is, is like this. It's like this first um, version, um, but it's not nearly as dramatic as Paul um, getting interrupted on the road uh, to Damascus. Um, he tells, of course, he had some Christianity in his childhood, but he had rejected it for many, many years. He was an atheist, confirmed atheist for many years. But as he tells the story of, of, of his, his uh, testimony, his conversion, there were a, there's a number of pieces that begin, that God puts in place that are sort of intellectual and spiritual um, shifts that start slowly happening. And then when, he, the, when you actually get to the moment of his conversion, it's, it's kind of anticlimactic. And in the story, I'm, I'm forgetting some of the details, but it's something like, he said, I was on the bus, and I think he said he, was, he might have been going to the zoo or something like that. And he says, he says I was, all, all I know is, on the way to the zoo, I wasn't a Christian. And on my way back, I was. And, and what, he, what he says is, is, basically what he means is like, there was all this stuff that God was putting into place, and looking back, he can see it, but he wasn't a Christian, wasn't a Christian, wasn't a Christian, was an enemy of God, was an enemy of God, was an enemy of God. And then on that bus ride, something clicked. Something dropped. And then all of a sudden, it went click. And he said, all I know, he says, I don't know exactly how it happened or when it happened, but I know on the way there, I wasn't a Christian, and on the way back, I was. So, but that's still an example of this first kind of conversion. It's still a stark contrast. He goes from being an enemy of God to a friend of God. He goes from darkness to light, even though it wasn't nearly as dramatic. In the second scenario, in a covenant conversion, uh, you have a bunch of covenantal light. What do I mean by this? Well, when a kid is being brought up in the church, you're being brought to church. You're hearing the Bible read. You're learning to sing the psalms and the hymns. Your, your, your parents pray with you. Um, they're teaching you about Jesus. They're teaching you to confess your sins and to forgive one another. And so you've got all this covenant light around you. And the question, though, is, is that light in you? So you've got all this light around you. The question is, is that light in you? And often, very often, God gives that light very early on. As parents are teaching, as parents are correcting, as parents are praying for and with their kids, um, Many covenant kids grow up not remembering when they were first converted, not remembering when they first believed. Now, you might be like Samuel, and you could remember that a, a key moment where, where it happened, but many kids grow up in the covenant and don't remember the first moment. There's the, there's the light, and there's light all around them, and, then, and they love the light, and God reaches down somewhere in there, gives them a new heart, and all you can remember is the light, and you love the light. You love, you love that Jesus died from your sins, for your sins. You, you love that he's risen from the dead. And, and you see him in you. You see the light in you, and so you know you belong to him. We, we sometimes refer to this as a, uh, in our community as a gloriously boring testimony, right? A gloriously boring testimony. And, and, and this is what we mean. We just mean it, it was glorious, and yet you, and you know it happened, and at the same time, you don't know exactly when. That's my testimony. I, I grew up in, in a Christian family, and I don't remember the first moment I first believed. But I can look back and see, I just, I just know the light was there. I loved singing. I, I knew I needed to confess my sins. I, there's, and you just see that. And so many 
Many grow up being converted in that covenant context. It's still happening. It's still a conversion. But there's less contrast between the darkness and the light. It was still there for a short time. Um, but because you're surrounded in a bunch of light. Now, the striking thing here is that Paul grew up in the Jewish covenant. Paul was a covenant kid. He was an old covenant kid, but he was a covenant kid. He grew up in the covenant. He grew up in the Jewish covenant, but he did not know the Lord until the road to Damascus. He grew up in all that light, but it wasn't light to him. It wasn't really light to him. Paul was converted as a covenant member the way the pagan Gentiles would need to be converted, turning from darkness to light. And so you have both these versions of conversion from paganism, out of unbelief to belief, and within the faith, within the covenant. And then occasionally, like in the story of Saul, Paul, you have them crossing. You, have, you sort of have both in a sense. You have the, the, the covenant, but that covenant light had been turned to darkness and he needed to be converted like a pagan. Now the thing to note is that all of that covenant light turned out to be a kind of darkness for Paul because it was the very thing that made Paul trust in himself instead of Christ. So, so when you're growing up in the covenant and, and, the, and, and you're coming to church and you're singing the songs and the gospel is being presented, if, if God gives you that new heart, you see it all as grace. You say, I don't deserve any of this. God is good. I don't deserve any of this. God is good. But what can happen, what can happen sometimes, is if God hasn't given you a new heart, you start trusting in the light rather than trusting in Christ. You trust in the fact that you go to church. You trust in the fact that you're, you know, your dad is a leader in the church. You trust in the fact that you sing in the choir. You trust in the fact that you know your catechism. You trust in the fact that you do the Bible reading challenge. You're trusting in the light rather than trusting in Christ, who is the light. And this is what Paul says that he basically did. In Philippians 3, verses 4 through 9, he says, look, if you want a Christian resume, I got one. You know, a Jewish resume. Uh, 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 the good covenant kid resume. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, kept the law uh, zealously. I went to all the, catechism question, uh, all the catechism classes. I went to all the Bible studies. I was at synagogue every week. I did it. As far as the law was concerned, perfect, blameless, spotless. I had the resume. I was good. And he says, and I wasn't. And I wasn't. He had turned all that light into a kind of darkness. He thought he was good because he was good. He thought he was good because he did all the right stuff. He trusted in himself instead of Christ. Now, we see God saving individuals in both of these ways in Scripture and in life. So you've got these examples in Scripture. God saves people these different ways. And if I did a could do a show of hands and ask how many of you have a covenant conversion testimony and how many of you have a pagan, you know, uh, stark testimony, you know, there'd be various hands that come up. Some of you are like me and you say, I grew up in the church, my, ch my parents taught me the faith and I don't remember the moment when I first believed. I, don't, I just don't remember, but I just know the light was there. I loved the light and it was all grace. I just, I knew it was all gift and I didn't deserve any of it and, and praise be to God. And others of you can remember being in the dark. Others of you can remember walking in the darkness, and it might have been a straight pagan darkness of just sending up a storm and doing whatever you wanted and being difficult and wicked, and it might have been a self-righteous darkness, like Saul's, I'm thinking you're good. I'm I good. I go to Sunday school. I go to church. I, I give money to the poor. I do all these things. That's why I'm good. But what are you looking at? You're looking at your goodness. You're trusting in your own goodness, which Paul says is actually darkness. You're still in the dark if you're trusting in yourself. So we see both of these um, in Scripture, and we see both of these things in our lives. But what we, what we insist upon is that it is the same salvation. So God saves, broadly speaking, in two different ways, but it's the same salvation, it's the same potent grace, and therefore it's the same conversion from darkness to light. Whether it happened before, you can remember... John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb. He got a new heart really early. But you were saved from darkness to light. Or whether it happened when you were five, or when you were nine, or when you were 25, or when you were 65, or when you're 85. It's the same conversion, darkness to light. Darkness to light. It's the same conversion, despite the fact that we can see, generally, these 
to patterns. If you've ever been maybe camping or something like this or just up early in the morning on a walk, if you're in a place where you can see really far, if you're watching really closely, you can catch the exact moment the sun rises. Right? Like, you know, you can, you can be watching and it's like getting lighter, getting lighter, and then all of a sudden you see that first ray just go, poof, right, just like that, <laughs> right? Over the horizon, that bright, that bright light, and the sun has risen. And, you know, if you had a stopwatch, you'd be like, click, there it happened. I guess that's what the weather people do, right? <laughs> Who tell you when the sun is going to, what time the sun is going to rise, you know, to the second, right? But the, there, if, you're, if you have a good view, you can see that, okay? But if you've ever been uh, in, a, in a valley or in a place that's surrounded by great mountains, it's harder to tell the exact moment the sun rises. I, I remember this, noticing this particularly a year or so ago, we were camping down in um, the Wallawa area, Wallawa, Oregon. And, um, and the Wallawa Lake is there kind of nestled under these enormous mountains. And so you're in this great valley. And so, and, and so you can come out uh, and look out outside, and, there's, and you're kind of in a shadow. It, it doesn't seem very light. But if you look up in the sky, you can see, oh, look, the sun's up. You can tell the difference between the sky in which the sun is shining and a sky where the sun hasn't come up yet, right? Pastor Wilson likes to say, you don't need to know the exact moment the sun rose to know that it's risen. You don't need to know the exact moment the sun rose to know that it's risen. But we absolutely must insist that to be a true Christian, the sun must be risen in your heart. To be a true Christian, the sun must be risen in your heart. You must have been turned from darkness to light. You don't have to know the moment it happened. You don't have, and for some of you, it's, you don't remember. It happened somewhere in there. Great. Is the, is, but is the sun risen? Have you been turned from darkness to light? Or maybe you remember the moment. You were, it, was, it was dark, 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 and then it was, it was light. Great. Praise be to God, you know the moment. Glorious. You saw it. Glorious. The sun is risen. Right? We must absolutely insist that to be a true Christian, the sun must be risen in you. The sun must be risen in you. So Christ is risen from the dead. That's what we're declaring. That's what we're singing. That's what we're, we're triumphing in today. Christ is risen from the dead. And so the fundamental question is, is Christ risen in you? Christ is risen from the dead. Is he risen in you? When Christ lives in you, you come alive. And, and notice, this is not trying to get Christ to be risen. Christ was risen, and Saul, Paul, didn't know. Christ was risen and he thought it was something else. He was, he was blinded. His eyes were closed. He couldn't see. He was still in the dark. And he was fighting against the one he thought he was actually serving. It really is a stark difference. Either way, it is a stark difference. It's the difference between night and day. It's the difference between darkness and light. It's the difference between death and life. It's the difference between trusting in yourself and in your own goodness and fully surrendering to Jesus Christ and trusting in him alone. Right? Where, where is your hope? Where is your peace? Where is it? Where, where do you rest? What are you resting in? Is it in your ability to be good? It is, in, it, is it in your ability to overcome sin? Is it in your ability to keep the rules? It is, is it in the fact that most people think you're doing good? Is it in the fact that you think you're doing better than other people around you? Or is it in Jesus Christ and him alone? That's the difference. Christ is risen, are you? Christ is risen, are you risen from the dead? You're either dead in sin or alive in Christ. There's, there's no middle ground. You're either dead in sin or you're alive in Christ. Which one are you? Are you dead in your sins or are you alive in Christ? And if you immediately think to yourself, well, of course I'm alive in Christ. I go to church every week. Of course I'm alive in Christ. I, I'm in a Christian family. Of course I'm alive in Christ. I read my Bible regularly. Of course I'm alive in Christ. I'm generally a good person. You need to know that Paul had all of that too, and he didn't know Christ. Paul had all of that. He was a Bible reader. He led the Bible studies. He led the seminars. He taught the conferences. He, he did all the things you were supposed to do, and he didn't know Christ. And this is why Paul says in Philippians 3, right after giving his resume, he gives his resume, and he says this, that he has come to consider all of his own righteousness as dung. He says, all the best stuff I ever did for me was worthless. It was like dung. It was like refuse. It was like stuff that needed to go to the dump. Because he said, because all I did with it was trust in it. All I did was put my confidence in it, which couldn't get me a darn thing with God. 
couldn't get you a single, he says, I was, I was all upside down and backwards. He says, I consider it all dung that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3, 8 through 10. In Galatians, it says that the difference between this light and this darkness is the difference between the fruit of the spirit and the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5, it says this. It says that the, the difference between this light and darkness is the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. He says the works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, hatred, wrath, envy, drunkenness, and stuff like that. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And then he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22. Which one are you? Which one are you? Which one of those lists characterizes your life? Your life? Which one characterizes you? And the thing to note, the thing to note is that the fruit of the Spirit is not you doing better. The fruit of the Spirit is not you doing better. The fruit of the Spirit's not you. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit of Christ in you. It's not you doing better. It's not you. This is how Paul says it. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is, this is his summary. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I've died, and yet somehow I've come back to life, but it's not me. I've come back to life, I'm living, but the life I'm living, I'm living now with Christ in me. Christ lives in me, he says, and the life I'm now living in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The fruit of the Spirit is not you doing better. The fruit of the Spirit is Christ in you, producing things that there's a certain fundamental sense in which you say, what in the world is that doing there? <laughs> but I, I don't want to love these people. <laughs> but now I'm going to love them. I don't want to have peace right now, and why do I have this peace? If, if, if you look at what you think is the fruit of the Spirit, and you say, well, I've been working pretty hard on that. I've been working really hard at loving difficult people, so I mean, I'm getting better at it. You have absolutely no reason to think that's Christ in you. What are you putting your trust in? You trying harder. You working harder. No, it ought to be the kind of thing where you, you look at it and you say, I don't know where it came from. I don't know where this peace came from. I don't know where this joy came from. It's like there's someone else in me. Yeah, that's more like it. Right? That's Christ in you. That's the Holy Spirit in you. So this is the message. Christ was crucified so that you might die because everyone is born in, dead in sin, but we don't think we are. People are, are, are we're born and we think we're good. And the Bible says you're not. You're not good. So he was crucified so that you might die because everyone is born dead in sin and we need to know it. We need to die. And Christ was raised first according to the hope of the Jews so that all men might be turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, for the forgiveness of their sins, and to walk in holiness by faith in him. To walk in holiness to know Christ is to know this transformation, is to see this kind of transformation power in you. From darkness to light. It's, it's perilously easy, especially if you live in a Christian community, especially if you're growing up in the faith, is to simply think of righteousness and goodness based on comparing yourself. You compare yourself to the people down the row. You compare yourself to the other students in your class. You compare yourself to, you know, the public school kids. Look at them, right? Or look at, look at the people over there. They're, they, they're, they're pro-choice. Or look at them over there. They're so sexually confused. Whatever. And you, say, I'm, and you think that you're good because you're better than them? That, what are you doing? Right? You have, that's not the standard. The standard is God. Compare yourself to God. How are you? You say, well, that's impossible. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You say, well, that's not realistic. Right. Neither was the resurrection. Right. It's all connected. 
right? The whole, the whole point is what God is offering is not humanly possible. If it's about you trying harder, establishing new habits, turning over a new leaf, reading a book and getting some pointers, look, you don't need to have someone come back from the dead to do that. You don't need someone to come back from the dead to do that. You didn't need someone to die for you to do that. Christ was crucified because you need to die. And he was raised because that's what has to happen in you. You have to come from darkness to light. You have to come from death to life, right? What needs to happen, you can't do. He can only do it. So Christ is risen. Are you? Christ is risen. Have you been raised with him? You say, well, how do I, I can't make it happen, can I? I can't make it happen. No. But it's happened. Christ is risen. And it, it's, it's not like making it happen so much as it is opening your eyes. This is what Paul was sent to do, to open eyes, right? Imagine, um, imagine you see just like a beautiful scene. You know, you're maybe you're driving in the car with your family and you look over out the window and it's, there's like a waterfall coming off of a mountain and the sun is hitting it just perfectly and there's birds flying. And it's, just, it's just gorgeous. And, and, you, and you say, look, look, look. And, and your, your family's like, yeah, whatever, Dad. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> slam on the brakes, honk the, you know, it's beautiful. Do you see it? Do you see it? <laughs> it's amazing, right? And, and what you're tempted to say is, what, are you blind? Are you blind? Right? That's what you're tempted to say. And, 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 you, and you say, you know, you, you know, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe all this stuff. I just, you know, you all are kind of intense about this. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in the, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I do, I mean, I, I go to church. I mean, calm down. No, no. We're not going to calm down. No. No, this, this is the biggest deal in the world. This, everything hinges here. This is the most beautiful thing, or it doesn't matter at all. This is the most beautiful thing, the most glorious thing, or we're all wasting our time. Right? And if somebody says, well, I just don't see what the big deal is. What, are you blind? What, are you blind? And here's the thing. There, you say, okay, I, okay, I, I want it. I do want to be raised. I want to see. How do I see? How do I see? This is the good news. This is the good news. Christ gives sight to the blind. Right? All through the Gospels, over and over again, what is he faced with? Blind people. Everyone's blind in the Gospels, over and over again. Why? Because we're all blind. And Jesus came to give sight to the blind so that your eyes would be opened and you would see that Christ is risen, that the sun is risen. It was dark for 4,000 years in this world. It was dark for 4,000 years, and the sun came up. Do you see? Do you see that everything's different because of the resurrection of Jesus? Is everything different for you because that's true? And if so, then everything else, you say, yeah, glory, amen. I know what you're talking about. It's wonderful. It's glorious. But if you say, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, it seems, seems kind of, you seemed a little intense. Seems a little worked up. Seems a little excited. Yeah. Are you blind? Can you not see? And you say, okay, fine, I, I want to see. I want to see. Then ask the one who always answered that question. You say, Lord, I want to see. Open my eyes. Nobody in the Gospels ever got Jesus saying, oh, sorry, not today. He always answered the question. He always gave new sight. He always gives the blind sight when they ask. He always does. Do you want to see? Then ask. And as you ask, it will be given. Your eyes will be opened. You'll be turned from darkness to light. You'll, be ha you'll have the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll begin to walk in newness of life. Remember, this was given, this message was given by Paul before a king. Why is our land in such darkness? Why are there so many professing Christians in this land, so many professing Christians in this land, and why do we have so little impact? Why does it have so little impact on our land? It's because we don't know the one we're talking about. We're blind. Or the blind leading the blind. We're in the darkness, and so we have no light. This is the message that Paul gave to a Roman king. This is, this is the message that brought down the Roman Empire. This is the message that built the Christian West. This is the message that we have rejected in the West. And it's the only message that will turn us back. This is what is needed. At the core, at the crux, at the foundation of it all, this is what is needed. We won't go back unless our eyes are opened. 
We won't build something new and better unless we go from darkness to light, unless our sins are forgiven, unless we turn from the power of Satan to the power of God, unless he gives us the power of his spirit to walk in true holiness by faith. Father, please don't let us get off this point today. As we celebrate these things, as we sing these things, Father, please don't let us get off this point. Please do not let us rest until we have this peace, until we have this joy. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may have Christ in us, the hope of glory, true resurrection life in us now, and a certain hope of the resurrection to come. Father, we ask for this mercy to be particularly upon our land, for our neighbors, for our friends, for our family that do not know you. Father, we pray that you would look down in your mercy and you would give them eyes to see and that you would raise them to newness of life, raise our land to newness of life because we pray for it in the mighty name of Jesus who died and rose again. And Father, we pray now as he taught us singing. Recall that when Christ instituted this meal, he did so while celebrating the Passover meal. And thus, this meal is now the new covenant Passover. It contains the substance of which the first Passover was a mere shadow. It represents the fullness that the first Passover anticipated. One sign this is the case is found in the Lord's instructions to the Hebrews regarding some of the surrounding elements of that original Passover meal. They were, of course, to slaughter a lamb and smear uh, the blood on the doorposts. But they were also to eat this meal in haste with a belt around their waist, with shoes on their feet, and with a walking staff in their hand. The original Passover was to be a meal on the move. They did not have the comfort and pleasure of enjoying and savoring this meal because they were about to flee the Egyptian army. God's instructions were assigned to Israel that they were on a journey, a journey to the promised land. The curious thing about this is that even after Israel's journey to the promised land was over, they were still to practice the meal with these same instructions in place as a way of remembering the Lord's past deliverance from Egypt. But we can't help but consider the fact that continue the continue. Yeah. They continued to practice these things, and this was a sign that Israel's journey never really came to an end. Though they made it to the land, their Passover meal never reflected that the journey was ever over. In other words, they never came to actually possess the land in such a way that they could sit down in peace and feast and savor this meal. Easter fundamentally changes this. In his death and resurrection, Christ has remade and reconstituted what the Passover means. Of course, he was the perfect sacrificial lamb whose blood provides us safety from God's wrath. But you'll also notice that we're not in a hurry here. We're not carrying walking sticks, but rather sitting down. We're not clothed as sojourners through the desert, but are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We're not eating in such a manner as to communicate that we are on a journey. This is because in Christ, the journey that the Passover represented is over. In his sacrificial death and in his conquering and victorious resurrection over Satan, sin, and death, those who are in him now possess the land such that we can rest at peace and savor this meal. What is the land that we now possess? Well, Paul tells us, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God. Being now united to Christ, we now share in his inheritance to possess and rule and reign over all things, over the whole world. Our Passover meal looks different because Christ, because in Christ, the journey is now over. The promised land has been truly conquered, and in Christ, the world now belongs to us. And so come now to the true Passover lamb. Come to your conquering king. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ. On the Hebrews 1, it says that we do not yet see all things put beneath his feet, but we see Jesus. And so this is the key. This is the center. Do you see Jesus? And if, you, if your eyes have been opened, you know what I'm talking about. You say, yep, I see him. I see him in my life. I see him in my family. I see him in everyone around me. And if your eyes, and you say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Ask the Lord to open your eyes so that you can see Jesus. And having seen Jesus in him, you see the down payment of everything put beneath his feet. So go now with the blessing of your God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his risen son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit descend upon you and remain in your heart always. 
Amen.